boys and girls, children of all ages. Yeah. This is not the sideshow. Yeah. This is not the undercard. Yeah. No, no, no. This is the main event. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan Baldwin here, deep in the heart of the Green Studio in Denton, Texas. Yeah. And as always, my right hand man sitting on my left hand side, yeah. the Teflon talker, the yeah. Colossus of Charisma, yeah. the one, the only yeah. Mason Shepard. Yeah, yeah, let me talk to you. How we doing, Ryan? Man, it's it, 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 it you know, but we'll 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 get to why I'm I'm like I'm not not horrendously upset. Of course. This kind of weekend kind of went how I expected it with a couple of exceptions. Yeah. But yes, you know, so I'm not doing bad. Me neither. Yeah. I mean, one of my teams won, so. Well, let's dive right into it. As always, college football first on the docket. And let's talk about the biggest upset of the day. Tennessee snapping their 15-year losing streak to Alabama with a 52-49 to lead. Or win, I guess technically they <laughs> they led at triple zero. Yeah. So technically, I'm correct <laughs> against the tide. Yeah, Bama. Wow, what a game! Okay, yeah. so my parents were they, they you know they're my parents are Aggies. My youngest brother's an Aggie, and my middle brother kind of closely affiliates with the Aggies. He likes Aggie football because he grew up with it. I don't care about the Aggies. So my Good. parents were all go Tennessee because anybody but Bama type deal, you know? Pretty much. So when my parents started going, go Tennessee, because, you know, Tennessee kind of starts to open up an early lead, I literally put in the group chat, you can't count Bama out of anything because it's Bama. Yeah. And sure enough, they come waltzing on back in. Bryce Young remembers that he can play football pretty well when he wants to. Yeah. And they make it close. And maybe a, a couple of the weirdest field goals I've ever seen where Bama's kicker like has plenty of leg on it, just drifts off to that right post. And then I thought the Tennessee kicker had like chili dipped it or something. I thought he had gotten all turf. <laughs> Yeah, and that ball just kind of lame ducked its way over somehow, but no, it actually somehow got tipped at the line, and that still wasn't enough to keep that ball from going in, and Tennessee pulls out the upset. So my question to you is this. Mm -hmm. Is Bama just straight up worse than they have been the past few years, or is this a combination, or, or is this more of these lower teams catching up to them, or is it a combination of both? I would say, to answer your first question, I, I would say no. And the reason why is because if Bama is significantly worse than they have been, we would not be talking about this. It is still, let, let's be real, there are two, in my opinion, and my dad and I have talked about this, there are two national championships in college football. The actual one you win, and then when you beat Bama. Let's just be real about that. So I think... That it's like you said, you can never count Bama out because let's be clear, we all thought Bama was going to come back and win this game. So no, I don't. I've never seen a Bama team, quote unquote, worse. You know, I think that, you know, every team goes through lulls. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying Alabama goes through that. They may pick up a beating win next week. We don't know. But I think the thing is, is just that I think a lot of these schools we're seeing in the Big Twelve, we're seeing it in the Big Ten, not as much, but. A lot of these schools are like, I don't know what it was this year. Maybe, you know, getting on the hopium worked. I have no idea. <laughs> but a lot of these teams are like, no, we're not pushovers anymore. And again, you have to keep in mind, a lot of these schools, they're not dealing with freshmen. They're not dealing with sophomores. They've got se juniors and seniors playing now. And as far as Tennessee goes, look, you've got Peyton Manning. We've got Alvin Kamara. There are people that the University of Tennessee has put in the NFL. This is not a joke school what's by any means. And I think that they played an incredible game, and incredible in the sense of they won. They did kind of let Bama come back on them, but again, it's Bama. But I think that what it shows is just that with when, when you look at college football, right, there is always going to be a team that rules over everybody. Like we talked about last year. You have the big brother, but then you have the daddy, little brother, cousins. I think that Tennessee is a cousin in the SEC, and they're trying to work their way up. 
And I think they're doing a pretty good job of it because I think here's the thing. When seeing a team like I know you don't really approve of them, but seeing a team like Kentucky move their way up in the conversation, given that they haven't played anybody, but still being able to move their way up in the conversation. Because remember, they used to still not play anybody years prior and still be embarrassed. So they're doing something at least or Mississippi State. I think what happens when a team like Tennessee or uh, Mississippi State in the past or an A&M, disgustingly as they are, I think what happens when they are able to beat Bama, that starts chipping away at Alabama just because it's like, okay, because here's here's the deal. I don't know what the, the record is on this, but Alabama usually just, if they lose, loses one game a year. They now I'm not saying that they haven't lost twice before, but I don't know. It's not like it's been consecutive seasons. You know what I'm saying? Like, Bama has lost back-to-back. Because -back. didn't they lose last week? No, they won last week. But they still lost a game before last week's game, and then they lost one two weeks later. That still is like... And it's insane that we're saying that, that that's a record. Because it's like Bama rarely does that, where they'll lose a game... Then two weeks later, they'll lose another one. It's usually like they'll lose a game maybe in the beginning of the season and then a little bit towards the end they'll or, or in the middle they'll lose. If they lose. If they lose. But that doesn't really happen. So I think this is a great game for Tennessee. I think it shows that we should not take the volunteers lightly. Now I got a question for you because I know you're, you're the main man at deciding legitimacy or, you know, fad. Is, are the Tennessee volunteers legit? Or did they get lucky? Um, Legit or luck? Well, I think that Bama... I mean, here's the deal. Yeah. If I say Bama is significantly worse than last year, that does not mean that they are in no way not a top 10 team. 100%. In the NCAA. It just means they are not like as clear-cut as it was like the past few years, where it's like, yeah. okay, it was Georgia-Bama 1-2, and then everybody else was down below. Pretty much. Bama seems to have dropped a little bit. And I think Tennessee has quietly put together a strong class. Yeah. But I think that I, I, I just don't know if it, I still, now I think it's a little bit more clear in that Georgia is clearly the best team in the country. Yes. And do I like Tennessee against Georgia or Ohio state? Mm, no, but you know, I didn't really like them that much to beat Bama either. So, um, uh, I would say the win over Bama puts them in a more legitimate position than anybody else has been recently. Yeah. Um, but that being said, they still have a ways to go before I'm like, okay, this is because they moved up to three. Yes, they did. And, Which I think personally they earned beating Bama at least. Oh, sure. Well, they'll have a chance to prove it because you know who they have in three weeks. They Georgia. have Georgia. Yeah. They got November 5th. Georgia, November fifth, and that's basically man. I wish I could see that game at home. That's ba mm. that's basically your season right there. All right, like if you beat Georga, you secured a uh, CFP spot. Now maybe even if you lose, depending on how everything shakes out, maybe you can get a spot. But with there only being four teams, yeah, I, I don't. Uh, well, because they what what's going to happen is they're going to have to play well enough to at least get in the the SEC championship game to at least be in that conversation because. If they lose, then it's just going to be Bama and Georgia again. But if they play well enough to get into that game, who knows? I don't know, man. I think there's a halfway decent chance. Well, uh, here's the deal. They pro the problem is they're in the SEC East, so they have to beat Georgia. That's what I'm saying. Yep. They're going to have to beat Georgia, game. too, to get into that game. Yeah. And if they get into that game, they will have to beat Probably Bama again. That's what I'm saying. They would have probably have to do it twice. I, I think Bama could lose another one. Yeah, they, they probably I, would. I think if there was a, if you had to ask me whether Bama would lose the second or Georgia's losing to Tennessee, I think Bama will lose the second one long before. Yeah, they got Mississippi State coming up. And then and LSU, which is always a crazy a game. game. Ole Miss, which is going to be tough. Miss. Austin P, which should be just a that, that should be a beating. And then you've got the uh, the Iron, Iron Bowl, Bowl at the very end Auburn. of the season. So so Alabama could lose if we're if we're being if we're being objective honest, i could see them losing three total. three yeah they could lose against mississippi state which i don't think they will especially coming off this saban's gonna kill them lsu Ole lsu Miss or auburn, could, Miss or auburn could beat them now auburn's really bad this year comparatively yeah but still they could lose two more which would put bama at i want to say that they're at their record is they're six and one right now yeah 
So Bama, wait a minute. I thought they lost a couple weeks ago. How are they six and one now? Bama? Yeah. Didn't no. they lose a couple weeks ago? No, they they almost, almost. lost to oh, yeah, today and him. Yeah. So they're six and one now. Then then folks, forget everything that I said prior to that about them losing back to back. I thought they lost a couple weeks ago. No. But um, so yeah, if they go to six and it well, not six and three, but if they go to like blank and three, then they're not getting in. Depends on how well the volunteers do, because I looked at the rest of their schedule. Um, they got Kentucky. They've got and Kentucky. Georgia and... They've got Georgia. Hey, hey, Missouri can take a win off of you. They're not good, but they. There's one of those teams like South Carolina is the same way. They're only given up. Missouri's only given up sixty points total for the season. It's just they've only scored fifty three. So if they can figure an offense out, then yeah, they can. They can take. Yeah, it, it, it also or depending six, on where that game is played. Conference. But yeah, yeah, no, the Missouri can take a one off you. See, and this is the dangerous thing. Tennessee could potentially could go undefeated. Here's the problem. Besides Kentucky, which because that is it's not really in state, but you know what I mean with like in state rivalry, that's an important game. But at the same time, be be leery of South Carolina and Missouri and even Vanderbilt. Those are teams that they're not going anywhere. <laughs> so that means they've got nothing to lose and can take a win off of you at any time. Yep. So I would be leery of those. So in my opinion, because I learned this from my dad, both teams, in my opinion, have tough schedules because just because some team is a loser does not mean you should not take them seriously because they can take wins off of you. And as we've seen this year, that's what's happened. So oh yeah. I think that um, we're in, we're in for an interesting shakeup in the SEC if Tennessee's able to take. You know what? I would not be mad because I've got nothing against Tennessee. I would not be mad at a Tennessee Volunteers national championship win. Will it happen? That's far fetched to say. But if it does, I got nothing. I got nothing against that. I got nothing against that school to be honest with you. So yeah. Um, so like I mentioned last week, that I thought this week was kind of what I called a break, a breakaway week or a separation week. Yeah. Because you're starting to see. So now. Bama's dropped down after this one. Yeah. Um, another game where it was little brother versus cousin. Yeah. Michigan beating up on Penn State, giving <sighs> Penn State a reality check. 41 to 17. Didn't didn't I tell you? Because I say this all the time about Penn State. Stop being ranked. They never Penn State never follows through ever. They get good at <laughs> Well, because they are good, but Michigan, they have to you look at the they're gauntlet not, they have to go through in the Big Ten. Just they're like, not, Penn State is good until they face someone equally or better than them. Now, Michigan, don't take that as a compliment, Wolverines, because you got to face Daddy Ohio State. And we all know how you guys fare against them. You just beat them out of like seven years just last year. So, but oh, good God. I hate that for Penn State. I like Penn State. But I just want them to stay consistent for once. Once. I, just, I don't even think it's a consistency thing. Look, it, in the East, you have to go through Michigan. Ohio, in the Big Ten East, you have to go through Michigan, Ohio State, and Michigan State every single year. Michigan State's falling off. They're not the biggest but threat in that. You want to talk about teams in SEC that can tame a game off of you. Michigan, Michigan State, State is one of those teams, do that yeah. too. But So that's just every single year. So Penn State. Are they better than Maryland? Yeah. Indiana? For sure. Rutgers? Yeah. I'd say they're probably better than most of the teams in the West, the way that Minnesota and Nebraska have fallen off. Yeah. They just happen to play in the East. Yeah. I bet, I bet if Penn State was in the Big Ten East, if you swapped, like, Wisconsin and Penn State, I bet the I bet Penn State would win the uh, the West every single, not every single year, but most years. Yeah. I. You know, here's the thing about Penn State to me, because I—, I they they were in the Rose Bowl last year. I, were, were they in the Rose Bowl? Did, were they the ones that played Utah? I feel like Penn State went to a big bowl game last year. Um, one sec. Um, they played Arkansas in the Outback Bowl. <clears throat> okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but no, here's the thing. Here's the thing with Penn State. I will I will say um give you a little fun fact. A fun fact with Mason. Yeah. I like fun facts. So Penn State is actually is actually my second favorite college team. Oh. So um You just hate their uniforms. No, I actually like them. No, we talked about this because I brought up like Bama and yeah, Penn State but, and these classics oh, and well, you're no, like no, no, not, no, they're so plain. Change them up a little bit. Bama's <laughs> was. And it still is. But here the point I'm making is like, so that that's just 
just basically because their mascot's a mountain lion, if I'm being honest. But it's a Nittany lion, sir. We're we're, we're eagles, Ryan. So we're mean green, <laughs> sir. I'd rather be a Nittany. Lion. Get it right, <laughs> UNT Nittany Lions. But no, I, I think with Penn State, the talent has always been there. I think the talent has always been there. I yeah. think they are capable of doing something great. But like you said, look, we all acknowledge that Ohio State is is the great wall that everybody has to get over, including Michigan. And I think that, you know, we are looking at a dichotomy in, in the Big Ten that, if we're being honest, is becoming SEC-esque, where it's, big br- it's, where it's daddy, and then you have big brother, little brother, cousin. And if Penn State wants to, because I agree with you, Michigan State, as, even though they don't play well, they're still little brother yeah. because they have that legacy established. So if Penn State wants to move to Little Brother, they they've kind of got to get into the mindset of okay, because the the point that I'm making is what you you touched on. Yes, I know that they can beat uh, Maryland and Indiana and Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa. I know that they can beat them. Here's the thing: those teams in one year can be ranked, and the next three cannot be. Penn State has always had a problem beating teams, like I said, who are as good or better than they are. I want them to beat a Michigan State. I want them to beat a Michigan. I want them to beat Ohio State. I I would love Penn State to be the face of the Big Ten. But in order for them to make that jump to daddy, they have to manage big brother and little brother. And you've already established that little brother can take a win off of you, and big brother just spanked them. So I think that we kind of – I think Penn State has always the talent. They have the the great coaching because James Franklin is still their coach, right? Or did he get like moved out a couple years ago? Mm, Penn State uh, coach. Um, it is James Franklin. Yeah. So James <laughs> Jeffrey Franklin. James Jeffrey Franklin. So there's the talent there. There's the coaching there. They just gotta they gotta put it together. Speaking of put it together, TCU folks. Woo! What about that segue for you, pal? Frogs, um, ribbit. <laughs> you know, you know, theirs is, is like is this. That's not even. It's like that's there, they, but it, that's like a little bunny foo foo. Don't talk to me. That's TCU. That's got nothing to do with me. <laughs> Double OT win for the little bunny foo foos hopping through the forest, <laughs> picking up the field mice and bopping them on the bopping them on the head. Yep. Over number eight Oklahoma State. Sorry, pokes, dude. You want to talk about a team that is like consistently for the past like five, 10 years up in that top 10 ranking for like most of the season. And then they like lose one or two big games and all of a sudden they're back in that mid range by the end of the season. Yeah. Oklahoma State every year. I swear. Yeah. They start off really good. They go five and oh, six and oh, something like that. And then they drop a game. And then they drop another. And then next thing you know, they're back towards like 16 to 18 for the rest of the season. Yeah. So, again, here we go. Oklahoma State, a, a team that a a team, team that has that, that talent, the coaching. They just can't put it together. You know, man, I think what it is is just like TCU. I don't know, man. Like I said, again, we're dealing with juniors and seniors. And people don't realize in college football – You know, um, that's a big difference when you have, you know, just teams that are like, oh, you know, you're the laughing stock and ha ha ha. And then it's like, oh, wait a minute. You're putting a run together. You're you're putting a team together. You're actually showing what you can do. I think always for teams like TCU, I never thought I would say this, but Kansas, I think with teams like that, it is always easy for them to shock everybody than it is for them to be like, we can play football like anybody else because obviously nobody's going to believe that. So, you know, I think for those teams, uh, especially for TCU and when they play Oklahoma State, I think for those teams, I think it is, they're like, this is our time to prove ourselves. And I think, you know, there's no better time to do it than right now. Oklahoma State to me, and it's like you said, they have always been, oh, man, so close because wasn't it last year they were number five in the country because they were number five at some point oklahoma state yeah yeah i think they were they were number five they were five or six or something and they 
lost that game to Baylor, and it was all downhill from there. So, I don't know, man. Uh, over there in uh, Stillwater, which is way better than Norman, uh, over there in Stillwater, man, they, they have some things to figure out. By the way, and I mentioned this last week um, as well, kind of going to this game. Yeah. Max Duggan is having a Heisman Trophy season, and he's not getting any buzz for it from that what I've been able to see. He plays at TCU. He's not supposed to. Dude, but listen, uh, he's he's for this season, he's rocking a 69.5 completion percentage. He's already at 1,600 yards, which yeah. is a 9.5 average, 16 touchdowns, one interception, and a 180 rating. That's crazy, man. This, this guy's getting he, yeah, nothing. Definitely Heisman Trophy level, Heisman candidate level for sure. And that's just passing because he also has rushed for, what is it? Like, um, hold on, let me find the rushing for this year. He's rushed for 261 yards and four touchdowns as well. Dang. Yeah, so, I mean, the guy is getting nothing. Tied, uh, he's seventh, he's 87.1 QBR for the season, tied for seventh. Tied for 17th in touchdowns, tied for 47th in yards, and he's got the. I think if he can keep the string this together and get TCU a few more wins, maybe take him into like the top five, that he might. He he should at least be one of the Heisman finalists this year if he can keep up this performance because yeah. it is pretty ridiculous right now what he's been able to do. Yeah, you know I would agree with that. It just based on the stats alone, I'm I'm scared for when Texas has to play them because we're gonna be watching Heisman finalists versus. The greatest running back in college football right now, Bijan Rob- oh. <laughs> Robinson. I just say that because he was running around a lot. Yeah, yeah you know, Quinn. we still got the dub, but ugh. managed but, to squeak one out over Iowa, Iowa State. State. Hey, listen, all right. Before you make jokes, <laughs> no, Iowa State will take. Iowa State has historically been one of those teams that ruins top team season. Like they won't ever win. The, t- the the conference title? No. But at, go back and look at the number of times they've beaten, like, a top-ranked Texas or OU team, and you just, like, those start shaking te- your head. Though them in Kansas State, you play them in Manhattan, or you play them at Iowa State's house, or you bring them to yours. It's horrifying. But I think for me, when, when we look at these teams, right, and we look at a team like, you know, a TCU, or when we look at people like a Max Duggan not really getting that that Heisman recognition. Because I think even JT Daniels for Kansas was getting more Heisman recognition than he was. Yeah. But that's because Kansas is such a surprise to do anything. But it's just, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, you can see why. But I think for Max Duggan, I would just honestly, bro, keep chugging along. Don't, don't pay any attention to that. Keep moving. Because TCU, they're not the biggest team, but they are quick. So... And physical. They're swift and strong. So if they keep playing like this, I got no problems with it. So, All right. So that brings our top 12 at the end of this week. Number one, Georgia. Number two, Ohio State. The Vols running up into number three, Tennessee. Yep. Michigan won, but is going to just move up to number four. They finally top Clemson, who has dropped down to number five. Alabama, after losing to Tennessee, drops to number six. Ole Miss wins, jumps up two spots to number seven. TCU's win jumps them up five spots to number eight. Yep. UCLA up Ooh. at number nine. That won't last long. Um, I mean, they who did they beat this week? They did they play this week? I don't remember. Um, but next week they have number ten Oregon. Ooh. So yeah, you're right. That may not last long. But that's we'll not going to last. But I mean, long. that a win against number ten Oregon could fault them up a couple more spots, make things interesting. And then uh, number eleven Oklahoma State and number twelve USC after USC lost to Utah last yeah. week. Um, if I had to pick the next one to fall, I'm thinking it's either going to be UCLA or Oregon. Obviously, one of them has to lose, but I don't think. Ole Miss is going to drop a game um, this week. Ohio State has Iowa. Tennessee has UT Martin. Both of those should be relatively easy. Um, Number five, Clemson at undefeated or hosting undefeated undefeated Syracuse. Oh, my my God. I am so so tired of Clemson. I am so tired of Clemson. I don't even dislike Clemson. I'm just, I'm sick of the overratedness. I'm sick of it. 
They uh, didn't do anything to beat number five this year. Well, Nothing. They'll have a chance to prove it against 14 Syracuse, 11 a.m. on ABC. Like, like people are, you know what? People are going to watch that. But, like, Syracuse. Syracuse? Syracuse. The Big Orange, which yep. is literally their mascot. Orange on orange violence on uh, in the AAC oh at 11 in the morning. Uh, Ole Miss will be playing LSU. It could be a tough one. Where's that game being played? Is it Death Valley? Oh, yeah, it's Death Valley. Ooh, that's going to be a good one. Um, of course, I mentioned UCLA at Oregon. So that probably is that going to be in Eugene? Yeah, it could be cold. That could be a cold one. It could be a cold one. Um, the Longhorns traveling to Stillwater Ooh. for OK State. What Two, time is that game? 2.30. Mid-afternoon. It, it's a solid slate of games. Yeah, yeah. you got because uh, when we move when we move in November, that's when the games really get solid, bro. The early morning is should have some pretty good stuff, and then you get in the afternoon with Texas, Oklahoma State, and UCLA, Oregon, and then the six p.m. has Mississippi State visiting Alabama, um, and Kansas State against TCU. Should be a good week of games all the way around. Should be. Maybe a little bit more separation, a little bit of a clearer picture, too, as we approach the rest of the uh, season after this week. Yeah. All right. There's your college football update for the week coming up next. NFL. Welcome back to the main event. Yeah. Still Ryan Baldwin, still Mason Shepard. Yeah. Moving on to the NFL. Yeah. I'm convinced that the NFL gave... That what they knew were going to be the worst matchups to Amazon for their opening season of Thursday night football streaming. Yeah. After last week's debacle, then you have the Commanders versus the Bears in a 12 to 7 oh game. Oh, God. Oh, it was just terrible. The game was as bad as Washington's name the Commanders. Oh, God. And then in the Sunday action, yeah, I like I said, man, I can't, I can't. I can't figure out the NFL anymore. Like, I give up. <laughs> After this past week, I freaking give up. You've got the Jets laying a smack down on the Packers 27 to 10. Laying the smack it down, yeah. The 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 Patriots, who had stalled out completely through, like, the first three, four weeks of the season, trashed the Browns 38 to 15. Yep. The Dolphins only put up 16 points with Teddy Bridgewater against the Vikings, but yet somehow Tyreek Hill had 20, 12 receptions, 177 yards to put up 30 points against me in fantasy. I don't understand. <laughs> the Bengals may or may not have turned it around as they beat the Saints 30 to 26. The Giants are five and one after they beat the Ravens 24 to 20. Yeah, Buccaneers lose to freaking Mitch Trubisky in this. Oh, no, it's Kenny Pickett. Not even Mitch Trubisky. They lost to Kenny Pickett and the Steelers. Yep, and there's Kenny P. And Kyler Murray can only put up nine points against the Seahawks, one of the worst defenses in the NFL. I don't understand what is happening anymore in the NFL this year. I am done trying to figure it out. You should have never started trying to figure it out. I am done. I tried it, and I can't do it. And I'm already upset, but that's okay. Let's talk Cowboys. Sunday night football against the dreaded and feared Philadelphia Eagles. And Cooper Rush doing us all a favor and finally putting to bed whether there will be a quarterback controversy or not. No, oh, God. Because there will not. There no. was never one. No. Literally. All right, I'm ranting again. Okay. No, no, no. Hold on. Uh, before you do, fine. maybe we can argue about this too, but the okay. Dak we saw on week one does not win that game last night either. To no, be fair. but here's the to thing. To be fair. Here's the thing, and this is the point. No one is saying that Dak Prescott played well week one. Literally nobody said that. But here's the thing. Bringing someone else in is not the solution. Here's the thing. We have moved into an era where the, your backup quarterback is supposed to suck for whatever reason, because your starter is supposed to look good. 
Why? Why can't the backup be serviceable? The reason why I'm upset about it is just because so many people, it's rush hour. It's rush. No, stop it. Stop with the corny nicknames. Quit it. No. Cooper Rush relied on the defense. He did do well, and I'm not knocking him for that because he didn't say this himself, so I'm not going to attack him personally. But no, Dallas has a starter. We know who that is, and Dallas lost last night because we saw what Cooper Rush is like against a team who is killing it right now. And you know that it's killing me to say that about the Eagles, especially the Philadelphia Eagles, because good God, have you met their fans? But anyway, you know, the reality of it is, is that Cooper Rush proved that he's not rush hour. He's Cooper Rush, the backup. He's the guy who sits there and gets called in when Dak gets hurt. That that's who he is. Well, he's not Nick Foles. But again, the fact he was that he serviceable. Went, yeah, he was. And he did what look, I'm not no we are not, folks, taking anything away from the job that he did. Yeah, he went four and one. He went four and one. That's good on him. Want? Yeah. But the reality of it is, is that he was not and is not better than Dak Prescott. Let's just put that to bed. Now, now, as far as people being like week one, da- look, I don't want to hear in about week one, Dak. No, he didn't play well. But guess what? Brady hasn't really played this well right now. Neither is Aaron Rodgers. So what I'm getting at is starting quarterbacks, they will have their lulls too. They're not perfection people. They're going to have bad games. I think I see now why Cowboys fans are one of the worst fan bases. And I'm, I'm a Cowboys fan, obviously. But that that mindset of what well, well Dak Prescott didn't play well week one so Cooper Rush takes place no, literally no. No, I'm not saying he takes his place. No, but, but here's the other thing: it's not good. God. If Dak comes in and plays against the Eagles, he look, look he's at got how a he good played. record against the Eagles. Yeah, though. but look at how he played in week one because he didn't have any reps during the preseason. Right? You could yep. tell he was rusty. You could tell he wasn't on it. Yep. And he was against a solid defense. Yep. You think that a Dak Prescott, who since then has not had any more reps and is again against a solid defense, that there's any way that he comes in and perform? Does he perform better than Cooper Rush? Yeah, probably, maybe. Is it but enough to win the rough? game? It probably would be rough. I don't. Yeah, I don't think it's enough to win the game. No, probably it probably wouldn't have been. And by the way, this is the first time. In how many games did we play last year? 18, right? Plus five. So this is the first time in 24 games that we've seen a team effectively nullify Micah Parsons. Oh, yeah. And that is a huge... I tweeted about this, and I, I think people are going to point the finger at Cooper Rush, and rightfully so. But the Eagles came out with a game plan and outcoached us in every single 100%, aspect. percent yeah. And I wish I could say that's something new that we haven't seen before, except we got outcoached all last year on the, you know, from just a head coaching perspective, which Mike McCarthy reared his ugly m- melon, shaping, head, melon yeah. head again last night on that. You saw that third down catch by CD Lamb where he stretches and it's clearly a first down. And then instead of A, challenging it, which was something that was an issue last year, right? Or was it the year before? Yeah, it was an issue Where there was the year. challenge that was clear that we would have won, he should, yeah. and he didn't do it. And he's like, well, we got people that, uh, we we have a chain of command there, and uh, we've got people talking about it. And I'm like, you didn't even want to call a timeout that you weren't going to use towards the end of the half anyway to throw the challenge flag and double check so you could get a first down. And then... Instead of handing the ball to your millions of dollar making running back that is great in these short yard situations, you decide to roll out with Cooper Rush and pass the ball. Woo! All right. So let's just put it. I mean, first of all, the Eagles are for real. Yeah. Let's just throw that I, out I there. I don't right think now. there's any. If there's, that defense yeah. is. Cr- Dude, let me put it to you like this. All right. That defense is. Sc- Scary good. Yes. Like, I'm not even on the offense yet. That defense with the way that the – and it's not even just the front. That, that secondary, secondary is freaking amazing. Yeah. The way they were able to shut down the field – and I'm not even just talking about goes Cooper Rush. In general, yeah. the way they shut that field down, you throw a ball up, one, 
one is covered the receiver here, the one goes under it and grabs it. Or, or better yet, the one is like, he fools you, so he takes a step back, you throw it, he comes up and takes it. I don't know what they've been feeding them in Philadelphia, but it is sinful because that secondary is unique and it is crazy. And the offense working under Jalen Hurts, here's the thing. I know people have criticized him and his passing ability and that he's not as accurate. But he can run, and his ability to run has opened that offense up. So, like, the defense comes up, so the tight end, multiple tight ends, uh, multiple tight end getting open multiple times. They ran the exact same play at least twice that I saw, and it was the one that the Eagles scored on their second touchdown. Yeah. Three bunch to the left. Brown went in motion to the right. A.J. Brown came in motion back to the left. That means they saw it was man coverage on the move. What had happened was, they read option Micah because they had, I think it was Sanders off to the right. Jalen Hurts read options Micah looks all the way. Pulls it back, and it basically becomes an RPO because A.J. Brown, in the meantime, has come back across the formation left to right and is now behind Micah Parsons in the flats. No matter what Micah Parsons does in that scenario, he loses. If he chases the running back, then um, Hurts just keeps it and runs for a first down. If he plays the quarterback like he did on both scenarios, it's an easy toss over the head to a wide open AJ Brown because he's fast. And I love our other linebackers like Vander Esch. He's a great tackler, but he's not as great coverage and he's not going to be able to cover AJ Brown. No. Um, same thing with Donovan Wilson. Just not going to be able to cover him in a straight, just drag route across the middle. If he goes back to play AJ Brown in coverage, Hertz is going to run the football. This is the first time we've seen Micah Parsons basically eliminated. Did he get held a lot? Yeah, you can throw that out yeah. there. But there was also a game plan to effectively take Micah Parsons out of even being in the equation. And no, not every team is going to be able to put that together because it requires a quarterback with some kind of knowledge of running the read option and ability to run and throw. Yep. But if you look at the Cowboys' remaining schedule, you know who have quarterbacks that can do that? The Bears yep. with Justin Fields. Yeah, I would argue the Giants can as well because I think Daniel Jones can run the football fairly well. Um, You may not be able to get... I mean, I'm not saying that Aaron Rodgers is going to run the read option or Kirk Cousins, but you start dropping these games here and there and... It looks like you may not, I mean, honestly, it looks like you may not even compete for the second place in the NFC East. You, you've beaten the Giants, but the Giants are beating everybody else, so you're yeah. going to have to beat them again. And you're going to have to beat them again. You're going to have to play the Eagles again. Yeah. I'm concerned. I mean, I wasn't bought into the Cowboys anyway, but no, I, no I'm really concerned that, because here's the other thing, right? Yeah. The defense gave up, and the defense is still great. This is the first time they've given up more than 20-plus points all season, and they only gave up 26. My only concern is what does this offense look like with Dak back, and how does Dak perform? Because, you know, we we talked it to death last season where they played the Broncos, and it was, oh, the Broncos have given everybody a blueprint on how to beat the Cowboys. It's one thing to have the blueprints, another thing to have the talent. Yeah. As we saw, because the Cowboys are still able to string to get there are plenty of wins, and I'm not sure how many defenses that the Cowboys are going to face that are going to be as good as the Eagles. But all it takes is a couple of losses when you should have had wins. Like, it, if Dak comes back and goes 0-2 against the Lions and the Bears, all of a sudden your season's looking a bit more, bit more rough. And I'm not saying that it's likely, but it is definitely possible. This is it, the Lions are not a great team, no, but they have a solid offense. Yes, they do. And you're asking a lot of this defense to go in and hold this Lions team that's been putting up 28 points per game to you know to hold them to that amount and. It, again, depends. Like in the same way that five to ten years ago, we needed the offense to stay on the field to mask how bad the defense was. It's really kind of the other way around now. Yeah, 
the more three and outs and turnovers the Cowboys get, the more difficult it, it gets to be for this defense to keep the offense in the game. That's just plain and simple. That's just how this works. I mean, if you're given the if you're consistently giving the opposing team great field advantage, yeah, there's only so much that you can do as a defense to slow them down. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, and you know, I I think that what is, and what you said is very apropos. I think what we're seeing now is, is it's on the flip side. You know, we everybody says defense always wins championships, and they do, and they can. We saw that with Peyton Manning's season, his final one that he ever played, but. Just because defense wins championships doesn't mean the offense doesn't have anything to do with that. Yeah. And Dallas has shown, unfortunately, both sides are never on the same page. It's either the offense has to carry. Because remember, last year, we were the number one offense in the league. Our defense was okay. We weren't bad, but we weren't the number one defense in the league. Now, we're one of the best defenses in the league, but our offense is like, eh. 18 points per game. Yeah, and so, again, and again, like you know, it's pre- maybe Cooper Rush, but I'm not. I'm, but, sa- yeah, I'm no, telling but, everybody, do not expect Dak to come out and be prime Dak against the Lions or the Bears because no. again, he had no reps in the preseason, nope. and he's had no live reps since that Week One disaster against the Bucks. I blame management. The only good thing is that he's coming back against the Lions, who have been giving up 34 points per game. But that does mean if you can only get 20 points. Then your defense the Lions. has to put in extra work for one, and and it's a troubling sign. Yeah, because if you can only manage twenty points against the Lions, the rest of the season is not going to go well. No, not a chance. So, I am interested in seeing how Dak does. It's a noon kickoff, so win Ooh. or lose, we'll have the rest of the day to contemplate our life choices and uh, think about our decision making for the rest of the season. Then we got the Bears at home again, also a noon kickoff. Um, I think it is very possible that the Cowboys head to Lambeau the week after at five and three. They, I, I can see them losing to the Lions or the Bears and winning one against the Lions and Bears. Um, and by that point, three weeks in. You, you'll you'll know what kind of season the last the second half will be after that Packers game yeah. because it'll be three weeks of Dak. It'll be the line is going to be kind of you know sorted out by then. The defense will be in full swing, and it's against a Packers team that on paper has not been good, but it is Cowboys versus Packers at Lambeau, and we know how that typically goes. Yeah. So you get two weeks to fine tune everything. I'm getting. Cowboys, I'm giving you two weeks to just kind of figure it out and get Dak rotated back in. But by the time, like, there's there's no more leniency after the Packers, or by by the time it gets to the Packers, you need to be dialed in and ready to go. Because after that, you have the Vikings who are five and one, the Giants who have come or who are five and one again. Yeah, yep, they're five and one. The Giants who are five and one. Then you've got the Colts who have quietly come back and gone three two and one, so they're trending in a positive direction. You'll have the Texans, who are bad. The Jaguars, who are 2-4, and four, but have shown they'll take games they off can of take people. A, they can take a win off of you. The Eagles. Oh, boy. The Titans. Oh, boy. And then you finish with the Commanders. So you do not have the easiest of schedules no. in the second half of this season. Every one of those teams can take a win off of you. Oh, for sure. So maybe the, I would argue the only team that you should 100% beat, the only two teams, are the Texans and the Commanders. Yeah. The Texans are not good. The Commanders are not good. You should beat both of them. The only one with the Commanders is that it's away, and that can get a little dicey once you hit January, because that's when the game is. Yep. But, yeah, the second half of this season is coming up quick, and you really only have a couple weeks to get Dak back and ready to go because you're, it's going to get kicked off right away with the Packers. And you know Aaron Rodgers is going to be Aaron Rodgers and trying to hype everything up and... Not, but you know, not really, because he's not hype. But he's trying to, he, you know, how he is. Yeah. He'll, he's going to try and douche everything up, and <laughs> yeah, you're going into Lambo for a three twenty five game in November. You're going into <laughs> the most hostile of hostile territory. So yeah, there you go, Cowboys, NFL. Oh yeah, and then there's one more game tonight: Chargers versus Broncos. Who cares? Uh, well, you know, it it depends. If we could ever find. 
the uh, where the the Russell Wilson of the past few years went. Maybe this would be a good game. I'm just not <laughs> sure. If, not sure if he still exists or not. All right, don't go anywhere because we're gonna come back after the break, do a little sports adjacency, and we'll see you back a bit. Welcome back to the main event. Still Ryan Baldwin. Still Mason Shepard. Yeah. Time to move on to the sports adjacency stuff. We like sports adjacency. I love sports adjacency. Okay. Four days ago, an article surfaces on ESPN. Headline. Sources. Colon. Snyder claims, quote, dirt, unquote, on NFL owners, comma, Goodell. (laughs) The comma is important. Basically, the article says that inside sources at the commanders have stated that Dan Snyder has claimed privately that he has dirt on all the NFL owners and Roger Goodell. And that's basically why he is still an owner through all of the BS that's gone through the commander's organization recently is because they won't, they won't take him out because he has dirt on everybody. Yeah. And if you ask me, I think he is absolutely freaking right. Are oh, 100%. you kidding me? Look at the stuff that we've caught owners doing. Oh, yeah. Look at the stuff that we caught Robert Kraft doing with yep. that massage parlor deal. These are 30 billionaires who cannot take each other out except by having everybody else voting against them. Yeah. If that's the scenario, what is your first line of thought? I'm going to get dirt on all of y'all. Yeah. Because... The only way you can kick me out is by having everybody vote. And if I can just get one person to say no, I'm golden. So I'm going to get dirt on everybody. I 100% agree and believe that he has. Now, level of dirt, I don't know. I, th- I think it, it's a high level. It, I mean, it, it could be like small stuff. Like It's, it's example, a mixture of both. For example, if that the, the story came out, which I never really figured. I don't know if they're still waiting on the paternity test. But you remember the, the, the woman that came out and said, Jerry Jones is my dad. Yeah. And I guess they're waiting on the paternity test. I'm not sure what the lawsuit still is on that. Yeah. But like that is not like, you know, that that's, that's not kick out from the NFL level of dirt, right? That's mm. like, okay, that's Jerry Jones. Come on, man. Like, okay. But that's not something that they're going to vote him out over. They couldn't vote Jerry. That Jerry wouldn't get voted out anyway, no matter what he did. Right, but I'm I'm saying depend. There's... And I say that, and I know people are like, "Well, what if it came out that he did this, this?" Jerry Jones would have at least one person, unless he had, you know, violently sexually assaulted someone. I'm not going to use the R term here because I don't know what the limit is on that. But unless he had violently done that, if if it's like an affair, he ain't leaving. If it's if it's stuff like that, Jerry ain't going anywhere. It, it would take. But I know I can guarantee you now he's one of the owners that Snyder has a lot of dirt on. Oh yeah, uh, and they hung. It, it was actually discovered when people would talk about you know the whole cheerleading thing that happened both on the Cowboys and the <laughs> Commanders. They were hanging out together when that stuff happened. And so no, again, like you expect me to believe. How many, I forget how many, it was hundreds of thousands of emails that they went over in this probe of the commanders. That, and you expect me to believe that the only thing that the NFL found was something on Gruden, which was, you know, definitely bad. That's what Gruden said. That's yeah. why he, that's what Gruden said. That's why he was um, threatening to go through with a lawsuit. I think he probably still is, but that's why he said it wasn't just me yeah. because we talked about it on the show. Actually, we were like. I said that he was like, oh, you guys expect me to take the... F- uh-uh, no, I wasn't the only one who said stuff. Yeah. And we look, we know that. The NFL tried to come through and say, we've heard nothing else. 
which we, you and I both knew was false. We have investigated ourselves and found ourselves innocent of any wrongdoing. Good any job. Any wrongdoing. Us. We we've done nothing. Well done, us. Good and, job. And uh, just to be perfectly clear, Gruden was the only one who said anything racist, misogynistic, sexist, whatever. He's the only one. No. 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 We know that there's more. And Dan Snyder, I believe. And honestly, I want him to dish it all. Me too. Selfishly, I know, because theoretically, like, depending on what it all comes out to, like, secret, you know, there could be something like, yeah, the secret deals with the uh, draft kings to tank certain games and stuff. Like, th yeah. Th Theoretically, the level of dirt on something like the NFL that has basically no oversight yeah, and is a multi-billion dollar industry is quite frankly disturbing to think about. But yeah. And it could potentially like, eh, I'm not going to say destroy the NFL because I know there's people that are going to be watching it anyway. Oh, yeah. Um, but it could blow the roof off the NFL and I want to see it. I need to see it. I don't need sleep. I need answers type. Like, I want to know. Okay, Ryan Bolector. I want to know it. <laughs> He's like, I, 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 I want to see it. Patty. <laughs> Why are you so serious? Like, you, you want to see it so bad. No, I, I think, uh, no. But I, I want to see it too. Yeah. Just because I, okay, let, let, let's put all the cards on the table here, right? Okay. The, the limited amount of cards that we have. Mm -hmm. Okay, we know that... I just like how smug that he is about it. I like how smug he is to where he's like, the only reason I'm still around is because I've got so much dirt on people, they can't do anything with me. So it's like, dang, bro, you're really that smug? And that tells you that he has yeah, a lot of stuff. Yeah, if you're that confident in it, you're pretty much sure that whatever you've got is enough. Oh, no, 100%. And I think that, I think what, if I'm being completely honest... And this is just this is just my assumption, right? I'm not trying to defame or slander anybody, but I think what a lot of the dirt that he has involves personal relations. I think some will involve like money being spent out of pocket and you know, maybe a little bit of embezzlement. I know that there's some racist stuff in there. That's mm -hmm. a, a, a given. But I think a lot of it is personal relations. Because okay, let's be real here, right? If all that he had was that this owner uses use the N word or whatever in specific emails, that's bad. But like, would that would that keep that owner from kicking you out? Not really, just because that owner himself couldn't get kicked out because someone could probably say, "Nah, like he said whatever." We have to remember a lot of owners are white still. So, um, but if it was like personal relations, especially ones that eh, we could say in the eyes of the law are a problem, then yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I think that, you know, he. Ha I think he's got a variety of stuff. Like you said, I think it's stuff that ranges from it maybe, you know, money stuff to, you know, personal relations. I just think there's a lot of stuff. I, it, it may even be about, you know, the owners personally, you know, like maybe a perception, maybe, uh, and again, I'm not trying to talk out of term, but maybe one of the owners is, you know, not who we think he is. I'll use that for on the safe side. And this guy knows it. And the guys were like, but just don't say anything because I don't want it to ruin the image of myself. You, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. The, so the biggest thing to remember in this kind of situation. Yeah. Is that it is always when the prey is cornered. Oh, yeah. That they start lashing out. And he is about as cor as cornered as he can be on the. And he's the still issue. pretty tame. <laughs> yeah. Saying that he's got stuff because if, if it. Don't worry, when it gets real bad, oh, he's going to start spilling. Dan Snyder, if you're listening, you can email me your files, and I will happily be the one to break the he's story. He's going to start spilling. You know what would be really great? What? Is if he does it while he's still under oath uh, <laughs> to Congress. That's probably when he's going to do it, to be honest. I, that That's the perfect mm, time to do it. Yes. Get, I will watch C-SPAN all day for that. Oh, yeah. That will be the most viewership C-SPAN gets in, like, 30 years. Yeah, because, well, football will still be involved. So <laughs> <laughs> that's the only reason. But, no, I mean, as far as the Dan Snyder thing goes, the guy's been really smug for a while. Um, you know, it's just one of those things where what's been going on at Washington is unacceptable morally and just, you know, ethically. 
And I know that Jerry Jones is involved in that. You know, it's kind of, it's not hard to tell. Um, and I, I, I can't wait to see what else happens. This is better than like any other reality show. It's actually based in reality. The real housewives of NFL owners like Jesus. Well, you know what else happens on reality shows? Fights. Fights, yes. And arguments. Yes. Which is the topic of our second sort of sports adjacency things. And, um, you know, it, I think the, the most recent weekend has a good example of it. Robbie Anderson getting all up in the face of his receivers coach over uh, that, Carolina. That definitely has been happening a lot more before him. It was the Jets. A yep. uh, defensive lineman got <laughs> literally head, head to head. Like Rams, Antonio Brown just stripping down <laughs> at the uh, in the front of like the whole stadium. And people thought Dio and Ocho Cinco were bad. Um, oh, well, even like um, Trayvon this past week too. Yes. Trayvon taking off his helmet, helmet and slamming, slamming it, it down. down. You know the Cowboys in general. Um, you know there was that scuffle at the end of the Eagles game. That one along with Trey, uh, here's here's what I say, and I learned this I learned this from my dad and just watching so much sports. I have no sympathy for players when they're like, man, you know, my emotion just got the best. It's like, listen, you had time to prepare. You went out. I'm not saying don't be passionate and don't be upset. You can be. But when you do it on the field as like a, like when like, I'm not saying people are personally trying to make it a public tantrum, but when you do it on the field, you know, no, because you had your time to beat them, and you didn't. Yeah. So take it, express it on your own time. Don't don't bring it to the game, and do not because it kind of bothers me when players are like, "Man, I'm so mad, and this guy's blocking me like defensive line, so I'm just gonna take him down." Because that's what happened. He took the guy down, and then they're just like, and it's like, why didn't you do that during the game? You had time to take this guy down during the game and win, and you didn't do that. Don't start fighting now. And I think one of the things that kind of irks me about that is just like, I'm so sick of players' pride and stuff like that. Like, I'm I'm so mad, and this guy said this, so ah, you know, I'm, I'm gonna like, no, stop. Beat him up between the lines. Beat him up until that clock hits triple zero in the fourth quarter. Don't start doing all of this extra stuff because you're mad. Odell Beckham Jr. is the king of that. We saw that when you know years prior with the Josh Norman thing because he was frustrated. And they were getting into hand, he was getting hand checked and they were getting into fights and stuff. Saw that when he like slammed his helmet into the the kicker's uh the kicker's net and it came and bashed him in the head. It's one of those things where I understand being but even then, at least that was on the sidelines. You know, Brady breaking that tablet, at least it's like on the sidelines and not during the actual game. Well, and to be fair to like OBJ and Tom Brady in that scenario, if it wasn't for the fact that there's now cameras literally yeah. everywhere, like in the 80s or 90s, you probably don't really catch that. No. Um, But the other thing that I think is an issue here is that young kids watch the NFL, and they yeah. see this. I was calling a Frisco ISD football game on Thursday, um, Argyle versus Emerson, and there are where I think – at least two, possibly three, unsportsmanlike conduct penalties just in the first two quarters. And it was stupid crap. Like, a guy tackled a dude, and just to be it, you know, a little crap, he shoved the kid's head down to use it. Like, as he was getting up, he, like, stood up, or he was on his knees, getting back up, shoved the guy, the ball carrier's head back down into the turf. I'm like... That's not even an intimidation thing. That's just like you being a dick. That is just straight up bad sportsmanship and a crappy thing to do. But where do they learn it? They see Ndamukong Su in the NFL <laughs> stomp on a guy and do that same thing where he like shoves a guy's head in the helmet. And twice. Tw and twice. Stomp. Still in the NFL. <laughs> and then he gets a ring. Yeah. So it, it, inf it infects... It, it trickles downward and infects the younger kids, and I think that's really crappy because yeah. then they do stuff like that. I think for me, what, I, what I've what i noticed about that is, and I, and I said it pre a few seconds ago, I get really tired of player pride where you go out there and you start thinking about yourself and you don't think about the reality of the situation, which is, you know, there are other things to be doing. Like, no, shoving, because... 
I think a lot of things can be misinterpreted in the terms of like football and things like that. Like, you know, the players that talk trash, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Like the, the players that, you know, intimidation is a part of football that doesn't really happen as much anymore as it used to. But like these, but like you said, it's when you're doing stuff like that, you're not doing it to intimidate. You're doing it to be mean. You're doing it to try to, you know, that's why, to be honest, I was, I didn't like Brian Cushing. I always felt like Brian Cushing, he wasn't just, oh, he's really aggressive. No, I was like, Brian Cushing is, and I'm going to watch my language on the podcast, Brian Cushing is is difficult. He, he's trying to be a jerk to people. You know, Brian Cushing is, is a jabroni, and he acts like one. So, you know, I think that when you get players who have, like, a high intensity and they let it out in ways that are destructive, I do agree that it trickles down. And the worst thing about it is with kids, and you can attest to this and I can, when you're competitive and you play sports, kids hate losing. I hated losing growing mm. up. I hate it now. You probably hated losing growing up. Dude, you're probably I had more okay two with brothers. Now. All three of us despise. Even now, we still get pretty com- Not nearly as bad as it was, yeah. but we still get pretty competitive. competitive. Yeah, so... When you're but when you're a kid that's amped to like ten, yeah, you you hate raging losing. hormones, yeah, testosterone flowing through, and yeah, I hated losing. <laughs> yeah, brother, but no, like I I hate you know, I hated it. So I feel like when they see it on TV, they learn, oh, it's okay. And even then, like just re- in regular life, they see that and they're just like, yeah, man, don't be okay with losing. Don't be okay with the fact that this guy got a first down. Shove his head in the dirt. Make a make a point. It's okay to not be okay with it. Yeah, it's okay no, to be frustrated yeah. by it. But again, as you mentioned, do it within the lines. Yeah. Play it within the rules of the game. And that's the other thing, too, is like, honestly, when I was playing, if somebody cheap shot at me, I'm like, I'm in your head now. Yeah. You just you just told me that I am so up in your noggin that you have to try and cheap shot me to take out your frustration. Yeah. I love that. I love it when somebody did it. I still think it's crappy that they did it. Yeah. Well, but from a competitor perspective, it's... I think but, that's I, I think that's a really cerebral way to look at it. And But not every kid. I know not every kid. No. Think I, I mean, way. most of the kids that play these days can't spell cerebral or, or know what it means. But I, I don't know about that. <laughs> it's it's, it's just, just running comedy. But no, in all seriousness, I think that in reality, I think what it comes down to is it it turns into a a pride thing when things like that happen. Like with OBJ. Again, because this is the best example that I've seen in years, besides like, you know, Andre Johnson and Cortland Finnegan. He was he was upset with like because Josh Norman made comments about OBJ's personal life. Pride wise, he was like, I'm not going out here to play football. I'm going out here to make sure he knows I'm a man. And when you push me, I will push back. And he did several times to the point where he got ejected for it because some of the actions that he took to show that he would push back were on the extreme side of things. I think when you look at it from the perspective of, you know, you know, we talk about, we've talked about a lot this year, honestly, with this perspective of, Playing the game like you know people are watching you, like children. I think when we get into the perspective of this, it becomes like when you look at athletes today, there's a lot of individual individuality in sports now. See, back then, especially even when you were growing up um, in like in the 80s and whatever, individuality. Whoa, whoa, I was not that. No, no, no. I'm talking like <laughs> past that. Yeah. I'm giving you a hard time. Uh, <laughs> you always do, Ryan. But no, like in all seriousness, like in like – Previous years, there was no autonomy in, in in unless you were the star. But even then, you had to be a like big mega star. star. Right? Yeah, like you think it, it was. It was not if you so like go back to the eighties. Yes, it was Bird and the Celtics and yep. Johnson and the Lakers. Yes, how many other superstars can you name from the eighties that were like symbolizing of their team? Not very many. No, and. It kind of yeah the, the there every team now has its superstar it has a face whereas before sometimes you would just have a team Utah Jazz are a good example when I was coming up you know Deron Williams yeah. Carlos Boozer 
they were serviceable, but none of them were like superstars. Yeah, there was no one that was like, oh, it's Carlos Boozer and the Utah Jazz. Yeah, exactly. It was just like they were the all stars, but they weren't like mega stars. Yeah. But now Giannis is the face of the Bucks. Yeah. Luca's the face of the Magic. Yep. Zion's the face of the Pelicans. You said yeah. Luca and the Magic. Mavericks. Mavericks. I thought I said Mavericks. No, you said Magic. My bad. Mavericks. <laughs> Uh, Zion and the Pelicans. Every team now has, has a, a star. face and a star. And then I think as well, it's been a little bit more like this with the NFL for a while. In yeah. my opinion, ever since Johnny Unitas kind of came in and revamped the quarterback position into like the superstar of the team. Like yeah. the quarterback is the top position. And then eventually like the play followed suit, and it ended up just being that the quarterback is the most important position. Well, yeah, because then you had, you had Johnny Unitas, and then after him, you have the guy who really turned it into, like, you know, the guy with superstar, oh, which Broadway was... Broadway Joe. Um, yeah, Broadway say, Joe. Dude, I um, cannot you, with you Unitas was, yeah, I was. I was thinking you meant Broadway Joe. I meant Broadway Joe. But, yeah, Broadway Joe. You know, he turned the quarterback into, like, as a matter of fact, you know, another fun fact. Yeah. Yeah. Um... That is where Ric Flair got his inspiration for the Nature Boy. Oh. Um, was watching Joe. Uh, what's his real last name? Um, Namath. Namath. Joe Namath. Pretty Boy Joe. Broadway Joe. You know, it was one of those things where it's like people always talk about who created the diva in football or or any sport. To be honest, it was Joe. Namath. It was Joe Namath. And I think at the same time, like when you when you see these things and you see like because. For a long time, people played sports and got their recognition through the sport. They got their recognition through what they did on the field. But when Joe Namath kind of came out and showed, like, look at look at look at the money, look at look at the rain, look at the women, which, and this isn't to be weird, this is to be honest, the women aspect of being a professional athlete play a huge part in a brand. Not as much as any more, but still a major part. Yeah. So with with the way that with the way things turned out and with how things were in um with how things were in just the the aspect of um seldom and then it becomes the popularity thing it's pop culture now and yeah now that creates that and everybody now as you mentioned has the personality right like 100% yeah like and it's not always related to football no, like who, the college guy that's now uh, he he's on the chief. Is he still on the Chiefs? The the Honey Badger. Yes. How many people knew that knew him because they watched football, and how many people knew him on Twitter because he was the Honey Badger? That is true. People know it's all changed yeah. now. Yeah. And so when big personalities clash, you end up with more fights on the field, and it trickles down. And I don't like it, but that's the world we live in now. Everybody's got to be a brand. Yep. All right, well, that'll do it for this episode of the main event. Thanks so much for tuning in. Big thanks to Dan Ball and Mark Lambert for letting us use the Green Studio deep in the heart of Denton, Texas. Next week, Mason will run through his entire tier list of every Cartoon Network character <laughs> that, I... that has ever appeared on the channel in honor of its 30th birthday. Yeah. You don't want to miss it. Yeah. We'll see you next time. Yeah.